Good morning, brothers and sisters. Uh, now is the time where we come to the word. At this time, I'd like to ask, um, why don't we read the word together? It's not that long, so um, I'll start with the first verse. If everybody could read aloud together the verse following, and then we'll just keep alternating uh, in that way. So, basically, I'll read the even verses. Please read aloud the odd verses. Our scripture text today is taken from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14, through chapter 7, verse 10. While they were talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried to bring Haman to the feast that Esther had prepared. So go ahead and read verse 1. And on the second day, as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king again said to Esther, What is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to half my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men, and women, I would have been silent, for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. And Esther said, A foe, an enemy, this wicked Haman, and Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. And the king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. And the king said, Will he even assault the queen in my presence, in my own house? As the word left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. Let's read verse 10 together. And the king said, hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of the king abated. Amen. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Almighty God, there are times, actually too many times, where we overcomplicate our lives and we overcomplicate the truth of the gospel. And so I thank you that we're not saved by our full understanding or expert understanding or in-depth comprehension of the gospel or the word. We're saved by grace. As you take the benefits of the gospel and you apply it to our lives, you grant us new hearts. You impart to us faith that is not of our own. You open our eyes to see, ears to hear, and minds to comprehend, not because we know everything, but in spite of the fact we know nothing. You choose to love us. You choose to make us your sons and your daughters. You choose to give to us what we do not deserve, life, eternal life in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so help us once again to return to that very basic truth that Jesus loves me. And because Jesus loves me, our lives are renewed. We have new life in Christ Jesus and our destiny, not just in this life, but more so in the eternal life is already secured for us. Please, Father, 
Remove the confusion that the devil and the world seeks to inject into this understanding of the gospel. That so often it's just colluded and obscured. I pray, bring clarity today to the simple truth that you, God, are now here and that Jesus has won. That once again, we may be comforted, we may be reassured, we may be given hope, and yes, Lord, we may be filled with the joy of the Lord. We commend ourselves to you, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So as I was struggling with this passage and prayerfully considering how it is to present this excerpt of Esther to you, um, the Spirit just led me to take a step back. You know how often it is that they say we miss the woods for the sake of the tree? Where so often we, we try to look at the individual details and we miss the beauty of the forest that lays before us. And that's what the Spirit was convicting me, that because this is a story rooted in historical reality, but nevertheless still a story, that was intended to teach a very, very important lesson about the victory of our God, um, I decided to take a step back and do a, not a complete um, uh, general observation, but at least you know, within a broader context of the passage, share with you a pattern that we may have been missing as we've been looking at the details of these passages in the, in the preceding weeks. Um, first of all, I'd like to share with you and remind you of the pattern of God's unseen plan. Just because we don't see God does not mean God is not here. You know that illustration that so often pastors use, right? We can't see air, but we know the air is here. Why? We have life. And likewise, we can't see God, but we know that God is here, well, because he is, obviously, but also by the reality that we are a people that have new life in Christ. Were it not for the existence of God, we would not have faith, we would not have the assurance of our salvation, and we would not have the joy of the Lord within our hearts. God is unseen, but his presence is powerfully known to all his people. And as we just take a moment to step back and review some of the things that we've seen, I wanna help you see a pattern that is very, very clear. That though God is unseen, he is nevertheless still working to fulfill his covenant promises. As we were reminded in our meditation uh, this morning, reflection that God is the one who works tirelessly to fulfill his covenant promise, both the curses and the blessings. We have to understand that. We live in a society today where they have tried to chop God in half, where they push aside and try to erase the fact that God is a God of damnation and condemnation and curses. Okay, maybe I'm moving too much. I don't know. It's, it's, all right? So, they don't want to see that God because that God is scary. And if that God is true, the people in the world, ungodly world, understand very clearly they're doomed. And no one wants to ponder their doom. And so often I hear, oh no, that's not my God. No, 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 I wouldn't believe in a God like that. No, the God that I believe is the old granddad that sits up on the throne heaven above with a fat belly laughing, ho, 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 what can I give you today? No. That is the image the ungodly world wants of God. But the true image of God is the God who works tirelessly to bring his word to fruition, both the blessings and the curses. And we see that very clearly in the story of Esther. Okay, not that you have to read this right now, but you can refer to it. First of all, in Esther 5, 1 through 18, we see Haman's delight and the Jews' uncertainty. 
Haman goes up, the Jews go down. In Esther 5, 9 through 13, we see Haman's unhappiness and the Jews stand. Haman goes down, the Jews go up. In, in chapter 5, verse 14, we see Haman's joy and the Jews fear. Haman goes up, the Jews go down. In chapter 6, verses 1 through 11, we see Haman's shame and the Jews' glory. Haman goes down, the Jews go up. So what are we seeing here? We are seeing that in life, the reality is both the ungodly and the righteous experience ups and downs within life. It's not that the ungodly are continuously experiencing good things while the righteous are continuously experiencing bad things. In reality, both the godly and the ungodly receive from God in his common grace good as well as bad. But here's the thing. We need to understand that it is not equal. People want to say that everything held the same, both the righteous and the ungodly live the same life. But that is not the case. And we see this clearly put forth in last week's passage in, he, uh, in chapter 6, verses 12 through 13, where Haman's wife prophesizes through the Spirit of God that if you are standing against the Jews, what? You're already condemned. You're already destined for destruction. Now, why would Haman's wife say that? Were it not by the leading of God? And that, and that passage is what I would call the pivot of God's unseen plan. That after this point, suddenly, that life, that road of life, which seemed to be same for the godly and the ungodly, takes a huge pivot, and God begins to differentiate the reality that the life of the righteous is different from the life of the ungodly. In chapter 6, verse 14, we see Haman go up, and the Jews go down. Haman is invited to the feast, and still the Jews are in uncertainty as they face their demise. But in chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, things start to take a huge turn. We see Haman's charges and his slide and the Jews' hope going up, where Haman goes down and the Jews go up. We see, first of all, that Esther acts very culturally tactful and wise, right? Because the king, Ashpharos, says, Esther, what is it you want, my queen? I'll give you whatever you want up to half my kingdom. And that wasn't the first time. That was actually the what? Third time, right? But Esther knew better because if she said, yeah, sure, king, give me half your kingdom, what do you think would have happened? Huh? No, <laughs> no, it wouldn't have worked, right? So she understood the culture. She understood the king was... It, saying that just to express his magnomony, magnum, magnomon, magnanimous, yeah, his very great kingly uh, generosity and grace, right? That's why he was saying it. And Esther understood that. She was tactful and wise enough to do that. And then she acts relationally tactful. She appeals to the favor and the affection of her king and husband. Remember, she was the favored queen. She was the favored wife. And so she appeals to his affections, right? She brings on her feminine charms, right? And endears the king to herself. And then she acts strategically tactful and wise and says, were it only the fact that I and my people were slaves and I wouldn't have said anything. Why? Because you're, you know, serious. I move too much. Okay, stand still. All right. Because your job and your life, O oh king, is so much more important, significant than ours, right? So if we were just being condemned to slavery, we wouldn't have said anything, right? So what's she doing? She's being tactful. She's being wise. And then she brings that accusation like a hammer down upon Haman 
and says it is Haman, the enemy, the foe. And what happens from that point on? Haman goes down and the Jews go up. Haman falls into fear and collapses in humility and the status of the Jews rise. Why? Because the one who sought the Jew to bow to him and was so upset because one Jew wouldn't bow to him was now what? Fallen and bowing before a Jew. Not just fallen, but begging desperately before a Jew. How the tables have turned. And then we see in chapter 7, verse 8, Haman's guilt and judgment and the Jews' vindication. And unlike before where the pattern switched, we see Haman once again go down and the Jews go up. And here we see a clear indicator of the fact that though God is unseen, he is still working in order to bring the curses of his promise upon the ungodly and the blessings of his promise upon the righteous. We see that God works to vindicate and save Esther and the Jews. How? God providentially has the king who was wandering around the garden, you know, trying to cool off a bit and trying to figure out, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? How am I going to save my queen? Right? Because remember, a law that was enacted and sealed with the king's signet back then was what? Irrevocable. And here his queen, whom he loved, begged for her life and the life of her people. So he was in a bind. How would he address this? How would he take care of Haman? And at that point, God providentially has King Ashverus enter back into the queen's room as what? Haman is falling upon Queen Esther. Now, I don't know how he fell. I don't know what he exactly saw. But obviously, it was enough for the king to say, how dare you assault my queen even in my palace? Right? Now, whether it was really that way or just the king interpreting it that way, don't know. But this is very important. Why? Because as Ian Duguid points out in his commentary, the king was given a cultural and political reason to punish and put Haman to death. Not for tricking the king and making the king look like a fool, to actually approve the death of his own queen and her people, but for assaulting the queen, which is a no-no. And so we are told, before the words even finished coming out of the king's mouth, what happened? His head was covered, right? And that was an indicator of judgment. And so Haman went down and the Jews went up. In chapter 7, verse 9, likewise, we are shown Haman's condemnation and the Jews' deliverance. Haman goes down, and the Jews go up. And here, God once again reveals the reality of how he works, where he brings upon Haman his own folly. For he says in Psalm chapter 7, verse 14 through 16, Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head, and on his own skull his violence descends. Is this an example of karma? No. This is God saying, this is my modus operandi. This is my M.O., that when the wicked plan disaster upon the righteous, their own wickedness will come upon their own heads. And we see that Haman, 
who had taken delight in the thought of hanging Haman upon the gallows. By the way, that is a sanitized version of what it really says, because back then they didn't have hangman's nooses. The gallow was actually a very tall wooden pike where they would impale the prisoners, the condemned. So Haman had prepared a pike 20 cubits high so that Mordecai's body could be seen impaled by everyone as an act of judgment upon the one he hated. But now God had brought that upon him that curse upon Haman's head. And we are told that Haman was impaled upon the very implement that he, u- that he desired to use upon the Jews. What a clear portrayal of what God has promised here in the book of Psalms. And we are brought finally in chapter 10, verse 10, chapter 7, verse 10, to the period of God's unseen plan. Now, the period here means the period at the end of a sentence. The final, final, final word. And what is that? It is the death to the enemies of God and life to the people of God. Haman's final downfall and the Jews' victory. That is the big picture. That no matter how it may seem that the righteous and the ungodly have lives that are similar, that is not the truth. Our life course is not the same because God, though unseen, who is working, has said there is a different road of life for those who are righteous and for those who are ungodly. Not because of fate, not because of karma, but because he, as the living God, is working every single day to keep his covenant promise of curses upon the ungodly and blessings upon the righteous. This is the truth that the world, that Satan doesn't want you to see and understand clearly. Satan and the ungodly want us to live in confusion. They want us to look at our lives. They want us to look at the world and say, oh, if God is real, why is this happening? Why, is the, why, why aren't the wicked being judged? Why are the righteous being trampled? Oh, God, if you are real, why isn't it that we are the ones in power and the wicked that are being enslaved? No, why is it that so on and so on, Right? Because we look at our society, isn't that what we observe? Right? Today, the church is dwindling. The secular kingdom is rising. And we ask ourselves, God, 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 come on, why is this happening? But if we take a step back and we look at how God has worked throughout history, we see the truth that God has been and God is and God will continue to work to fulfill his covenant promise. This is a very important truth, brothers and sisters, because this truth brings clarity to how we can see our lives, to see how we can see the world and find within it hope, peace, and dare I say it, even joy, living in this ungodly world with ungodly leaders. And so I want to share with you an illustration that I often share uh, when, when I try to help people understand the biblical view of life. And now, this is the first time I've ever put it into uh, a slide form, right? I know one of the sisters said she's a visual learner, so I took that as a cue, and I said, you know what? I can try to describe this verbally, but if I want it to really stick in the minds of people, I think I'm gonna have to do it graphically. So um, if you could switch the slides. Okay. 
Da, 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 da. All right, so this is a graph. You have the good life up top, right? Oh, no, no, not, not yet, not yet. Oh, you, yeah. you have the good life at top, you have the bad life at bottom, and that lying horizontally going across is just the road of life, okay? Now, go ahead and click. This, you could say, is like a graph of a typical life, right, of a righteous person. They're born, you know, all things are good, they're kids, you know, then they get into high school, <laughs> junior high, right? They have their first breakup, whatever, and then they, you know, they, ha they get into college. It goes up, boom, you know, suddenly they don't get into the, you know, or they apply to college, they don't get into the college of their dreams, <laughs> you know, just excite disappointments, successes, and all these things, right? This, this is like a typical graph of a lot of people's lives, right? The righteous, okay? We have ups, we have downs, and there are times where we are so far down, we're like, God, are you real? And we struggle with our faith. We struggle with the reality of God's promises, right? And sometimes we do so until life ends. Okay, next one. Now, this, you could look at it as the graph of the ungodly, right? And I, I, I sort of took it to an extreme where so often we see ungodly people, they seem like us, but suddenly things change, and for some reason, their lives just seem better than us, right? The majority of the people who are rich and living in luxury, are they godly or ungodly, right? I mean, the people who seem to succeed and get promotions, are they usually the godly or the ungodly, all right? And what we see is so often, it's the ungodly who are succeeding the ungodly who seem to be blessed. And, I mean, they dip into the bad life every once in a while, it seems like. But a lot of times we see ungodly people being very, very, very successful and living lives that seem blessed, right? Okay? I mean, that's not the case all the time, but we often see it. And that's why we often complain. Okay? So this is perspective of the road of life from the world's view. Next slide, please. All right? But what we have to understand is that something amazing happened that completely changed not just the course of, you know, the road of life, but completely changed the course of history over 2,000 years ago, right? A little baby named Jesus was born into our world. And that baby, who is the Son of God, grew up. And at the, age of at the age of 30, began a ministry that would completely revolutionize how the people of God would see salvation, right? So, next, Jesus came into the world, right? But when he came into the world and he began to do ministry, he shared very clearly with his disciples this very important truth. There isn't one road of life. There's actually two. Okay, next, what do you see, right? Je Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. That little green thing up there, words, it says new life. Okay, Matthew seven fourteen, And then the second road, proceed, is the road to, in the old life, the old way, where it says, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. So if you understand this, that there is a road of new life and the road of old life, and you look at those roads and you look at the journey of life that we take, relatively speaking, there are ups and downs, but absolutely speaking, in what direction are we moving? Huh? Up. Likewise, for the ungodly who are on the old road of life, relatively speaking, they are experiencing ups and some downs, but absolutely speaking, where is that road of life going? Down. Bad life. And Jesus says, for those who enter through that narrow gate, we enter into that new road of life. So no matter how many ups and downs we as people of God may experience within our lives, we can still be encouraged, brothers and sisters. Why? 
Because the absolute direction in which we are moving is always up. Yes, emphatically, up. Always. Why? Because our God is faithful. The promises of our Lord are certain. And that is why God says in Romans 8, and we know that in all things, he works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I didn't move that time. Okay, so, well, it's entertaining, it, it is. Thank you, God. That is the reality, brothers and sisters. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Because any other view are the lies of Satan and the confusion of the world. We are on the road to life and our ups and our downs all are a part of God's good plan to bring us to the greatest blessing throughout life. And likewise, we need to be able to convey to ungodly to the ungodly that no matter how many ups they have, relatively speaking, in the end, it will not matter because ultimately, they will fall into destruction because that is God's promise. Okay, I'm confused. I don't know what I'm doing. But anyhow, Jesus didn't just finish here, though. He didn't just teach that there are two roads of life, one for the godly and one for the ungodly. After teaching this, our Lord Jesus Christ willingly went to the cross where he bore the iniquity of our sins and took upon himself the punishment that we deserved, and he shed his blood for us, that our record may be wiped clean before God and we may be declared righteous and our accounts fully paid before our God that we need not face what it is that we deserve. And so, next slide. What we see is the period of God's unseen plan. Because Jesus died and rose again from the dead, for those of us who are on the road of life, the new life, next, what do we see is that life doesn't end at the end of this road, it continues for eternity where we will be with God in heaven. Likewise, because Jesus rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven will one day return as the conquering king, the ungodly on the road of destruction and old life, what are they guaranteed? Next arrow. That their life will go beyond death and they will experience hell a place of utter torment for all of eternity. We can't look at life relatively. We have to look at life absolutely. Because relatively, every one of us are gonna have good days and bad days. And we can't allow how we feel to be dictated by the relative. I'm not saying ignore your tears and your sadness and your pain. No, understand they are real. Go ahead, shed your, shed your tears. Pray the prayers of desperation. Feel the pain that is a reality of a fallen world. But as King David said in his Psalms, why are you so, down so downcast, O my soul? Rejoice within me, O praise the Lord. Because eventually King David, after all his complaining and his cries for deliverance unto God, would come face to face once again with the reality, God is God, and that he is loved by God, and that God is the covenant, God is faithful to fulfill his good promises to his people. And he was able to rejoice at the end of the day in the knowledge of who God is. Likewise, brothers and sisters, you must understand this. I don't know what your struggles are. I don't know what your 
complaints are. I don't know what your desperate cries are, but our God does, and he hears you, and he is at work in your life to bring about good. We just have to cry out to God for faith, like the man who wanted his son healed after Jesus came down from uh, the mount uh, after the uh, transfiguration, and he said to Jesus, Jesus, I believe. Give me faith to believe. We need faith continuously to believe every day that our God is at work for our good, that we not look at life relatively, but we look at life absolutely. And if you do that, suddenly things are more than endurable. They're overcomable. Why? Because we cling by faith to the truth God is going to bring us through. Are you struggling in your marriages? Don't give up. Love each other as God has commanded you to love each other. And pray that God changes you and not the other. And see what wondrous things God can accomplish and bring your marriage to even a stronger place as you trust in the absolute promises of God. Are you having difficulty at work? Be faithful. Love your boss. Respect your boss. Be the best employee that you can be in spite of the environment, in spite of the leadership, in spite of everything else. Be faithful to God. Trust in his absolute promises and see if God will not bring you to a better place, a better position, a better blessing. We as Christians must not look at life relatively, but look at it from the perspective of the absolute God and his promises. And on the flip side, we need to encourage the ungodly likewise. Don't look at life relatively. Otherwise, you won't see the fact that you're about to drive off a cliff into the depths of hell forever. Help them to see the little victories and the little, little pleasures and joys you have in this life. They're meaningless compared to the absolute destruction and wrath that awaits at the hands of an angry God. We need to once again convey to the ungodly the message of hell. For Satan has accomplished a great victory in convincing most of the world that there is no place like hell. And so many a people keep going forward only to end their lives and find themselves eternally under God's wrath because they believe in the lie of relativism instead of the absolute truth of who God is. Haman denied reality, and he lived relatively, only to confront the pit of God's absolute truth as he fell into destruction. Esther, though there were ups and downs, clung to the Lord, trusted in the Lord and in his work, and though, relatively speaking, the Jews and Esther and Mordecai went up and down, up and down, up and down, absolutely speaking, God was at work to bring about victory for his people. Why? Because God, our God, is a covenant faithful God who works constantly to fulfill his covenant promises, to bless his people, and to bring the covenant curses upon those who reject him. And so, when the world lies to you, and they will lie to you every day of your lives, and tries to convince you that God is nowhere, remember the truth, that God is now here, working in our lives. Why? Why can we have this confidence? Because Jesus has one. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to take this quick review of the passage in Esther where we see clearly 
the downfall and demise of Haman and the vindication and salvation of Esther and the Jews. Not because of karma and mistakes that Haman may have made, not because of luck and the good opportunities that Esther may have had, but because, God, you are here in this world working to fulfill your covenant promise, that covenant which is made ours and sealed by the blood of Jesus Christ, that you will redeem and save those who confess the name of Christ, and you will curse and punish those who reject him. Solidify and crystallize this truth in our hearts today, Father, that we as a church and we as your people will not fall into the temptation of looking at life relatively, but instead take a step back and look at life absolutely, where your absolute goodness is for us and your absolute wrath is for those who are against you. That we may find hope each day to live in spite of the struggles in this world, and we may have the compassion to call out to the lost, calling them to repentance, to believe on Christ for their salvation. And may we do so because, Father, we know you are real, that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, and the Holy Spirit lives within us to empower us to accomplish your good purpose. I ask and pray this for us as a church and as your people. In Jesus' name, amen.